Welcome all Nations Church. It's so good to be with you. I'm with you and you're with me. And you might be saying, well, Stephen, you're not really here. Yes, I am. You know, have you ever seen couples that get together and they're physically in the same room and they seem like they're together, but we all know they're really not together. There's a lot of discord among them and they're just not knit together in love. Well, you know, Paul wrote a letter to the Philippians and he said to them, he said, you know what? He said, even though I'm not physically with you, he said, you guys are in my heart and I'm with you. And I believe God that Pam and I, we are in your hearts as you are in our hearts. We are knit together in the family of God, in the love of God. And it's so good to be with you today. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit just to help us learn from the word of God. Precious Holy Spirit. Right now, we just ask that you breathe on the word of our Heavenly Father and that you speak life into us, that you give us direction, you lift us up, you give us help and hope. Download it from heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You know, one day a little boy was overheard saying, Lord, if you cannot make me a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a real good time just like I am. Well, folks, you and I, we may be having a good time or maybe you're having one of the worst times of your life. But I want to tell you this. God's prevailing truth is that God has a great plan for your life. I believe that with all my heart. One of my favorite scriptures, Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, I know my thoughts for you, thoughts to prosper you, bless you, and to have good plans for you. Not bad plans, but good plans for your life. So we're going to continue our series. This is part two of the No Fear Here series. Remember, No Fear Here isn't necessarily just an accounting or an assessment of what you got. Well, there's, there's no fear here, but rather basically putting up a statement Hey, no fear allowed here. No fear, right? And that's what we're doing spiritually in your life and my life. We're saying no fear here. Part two today is going to be called Giants Always Talk. Did you know that? Giants always talk. In review, part one of No Fear Here, we talked about the Hebrew definition of the English word fear. And we learned from Dr. Frank Seekins that the word picture is the hand you see. The hand you see will the hand be the hand that you're in awe of. So if you see God's wonderful hand coming, there's an awesome feeling that he's, he's going to provide for you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to direct you. He's going to watch over you. He's going to shelter you. He's going to heal you. He's going to deliver you and save you. But if you see the hand of the enemy coming, there's an awful feeling. There's an awful feeling because he's the one that's going to steal, kill, and destroy. So that's what we learned in part one of No Fear Here. Today, as we talk about the giants always talk, let me give you an introduction here. God tells us that we're to fear not. In fact, he says, be anxious for nothing or fear not over 365 times throughout his word. I believe that God's given us more than one command a day so that we know that we're to walk fearless Faith-filled, but fearless. Fear has always been the obstacle of creativity, peace, progress, and innovation. You know, world influencers, inventors, and leaders have said throughout the years that fear is the major obstacle to forward motion, to success. Henry Ford, you know, the great automobile manufacturer, one of his great, he said this, one of the great discoveries a man makes is to find he can do whatever he is afraid he could not do. Babe Ruth, you remember the famous baseball player from way back, he said this, never let the fear of striking out get in your way. Man, that's a good philosophy. Florence Nightingale, the one who revolutionized nursing as we know it, even to this day, her influence is still felt in the medical world. She said this, how very little can be done under the spirit of fear. If we change our thinking, we will change how we feel. If we try and change our feelings, we're going to spend a lifetime trying to run from our thinking. Simply put, behavior follows belief. Your behavior will follow your belief system. If you're going to live a good life, you must have good thinking. That's just... It's mandatory. The enemy knows this, and so he wages a war against your mind. His number one weapon of choice... What is it? Fear. 
Fearful thinking is common thinking. Fearless thinking is uncommon thinking. Fear shows up like a giant. It's big, ugly, scary, hairy, armed with weapons, dark and menacing, and yes, talking. Giants always talk. The fear giant will always talk. You know, whether it was Hitler back in World War II or a deadly disease, whether it's the coronavirus, whether it's poverty, an abusive husband, or a terrible storm, fear giants talk. Fear always talks. Do you remember David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17? It's one of my favorite stories. I know it's a favorite with a lot of children in church. But in 1 Samuel 17, we have the famous story of Israel facing the Philistines, a fearsome enemy. They send out their champion Goliath every day for 40 days, and he's taunting, intimidating Israel. And everyone is terrified until a little shepherd boy shows up in the camp who's supposed to be delivering cheese to his brothers and to the king. He shows up with just his slingshot and his faith. And what happens? Ten feet of ugly, talking about the towering terror of that giant, meets a small, faith-filled teenager. Man, teenagers, they can take over the land. And David, this little teenager, he runs up against Mr. Giant in the name of the Lord God, Jehovah. And you know what? Even though giants talk, faith talks bigger and better. And you know the end of that story. David ended up slinging his first stone, taking that giant down and ended up killing him and ended up being a big championship for Israel that day as they won the land. So where did fear come from? Where did this whole thing start? Well, you know, if you want to learn about something, and tr you have to go back to the origin of it or the first mention in God's Word. So where do we first hear about fear? Well, we go way back to Genesis, the very beginning, when God created everything that ever was. And he's made all the animals, and He's made everything. And Adam and God kind of create this little father-son business, and they're naming Adam. Uh, God would make something, He'd bring it to Adam, and Adam would get to name it, destine it. Well, that's a long neck. That's a giraffe, we're going to call it. And so then God, he's looking for a mate for Adam. He said, it's not good for Adam to be alone. Even though he's got all these critters, he needs somebody like him that he can hang out with and they can be in agreement. And so God takes a rib out of Adam and he forms Eve, makes a beautiful, beautiful woman. And he brings it to Adam and Adam calls her Eve. And we have the Garden of Eden. Everybody's happy. I mean, they're a little bit naked, but everybody's happy. There's no shame. There's no fear. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And we pick up our story, learning about where fear came from in Genesis 3. And let's start at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled in deceit. Remember that. The serpent was skilled in deceit than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, Can it really be that God has said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Isn't that funny how the enemy never changes his tactic? He did the same thing to Jesus in the wilderness. Did God really say this? Didn't God say this? Always taking God's word and putting a question mark after it and trying to sow a seed of discrepancy, a seed of wonder and a seed of, is that really true about the truth? So we know after that, Eve, she gets lured by the, the enemy to take from the fruit of that tree that she's not supposed to, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then she turns around and gives the fruit to Adam, who readily takes it from his wife and he eats of it. Well, then we know what happens. Instantly, they have knowledge that they are naked. Well, they always were naked. What happened? The glory of God lifted off their life. The beauty of God left our grandparents in the Garden of Eden. And suddenly they perceive that they're naked and they try to cover it with leaves. They try to cover it with a fake um, representation of God's glory. We pick up the story here in, in verse 8 of chapter 3. And it says, And they heard, our grandparents heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, like God always did. So the man and his wife hid and kept themselves hidden from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I just want to interrupt this for a second. Isn't this strange? We know that Psalm 16 says, In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. God's joy. There's, there's, righteous, there's beauty at His right hand. There's pleasures forevermore. There's the Garden of Eden in the presence of the Lord. And they are running from the very thing they want. 
Because you see, when you believe a lie and you get motivated by that fear, you run from the presence of God. You end up, when you make a mistake, you end up trying to avoid God. And here they are trying to hide themselves from the presence of God. And verse 9, but the Lord called to Adam and he said, where are you? It's not that God didn't know where he was. I think he was asking a question, trying to ask Adam, do you know where you are? Do you know how far you've fallen? Do you know you're outside the glory of God now? Verse 10, Adam says this. He says, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden and I was afraid. It's the first mention of fear in the word of God. He says, I was afraid. See, he had had a perverted, twisted view of God's hand. God's hand is always willing to save, to redeem, to restore. But he had a twisted view of the hand of God and he bought into the enemy's lie and saw himself through his shame lens. He saw himself through his fear and it, it corrupted his identity and he was on the run from God. He said, I was afraid because I was naked. I wasn't covered. I hid myself. Can you imagine? Isn't that the way we feel? We feel afraid when we feel uncovered. We feel afraid when we feel vulnerable, when we're ashamed, when we feel mocked, when we feel like somebody's talking behind our back. A fear can come in and then after that you get this anger. For the first time in humanity, we see self-protection kick in, trying to cover up, trying to lessen the vulnerability, but it has a dual edge. It also costs the presence of God. The bottom line is a lie is believed and fear gains access and then we start going for counterfeits. Leaves are pursued to try to cover what only God can cover. So here's how it works. The enemy tells a lie like you're not loved. You're not loved. Nobody loves you. God doesn't love you. And then all of a sudden a fear comes in based on that lie and you feel a sense of rejection, a sense of disapproval. And then after that, you try to cover yourself up and you make an alliance with a spirit of sabotage or control or perfectionism. Have you ever seen people? They're just OCD. They're addicted to perfectionism. Why? A lot of times it's because they've bought into a lie. They don't feel loved and they're struggling to compensate for the fear of rejection, disapproval, a failure. Well, that's another lie. You can't do it. So you get this fear of failure, a fear of losing. I won't even try. And that's what we do, right? We make an alliance with excuses, with blame, with injury, criticism. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, my, my legs, I, I'm not going to do that because my, my legs kind of hurt. Have you ever seen that? It's, it's because we're trying to take a leaf and cover our shame. Here's a big lie. God rejects you. Then you have a fear of judgment and punishment. Then you make an alliance with religion, with works, penance, maybe even sickness. I'm not feeling good. So, you know, it's like, I'm going to reject you before you reject me. And here's another big lie. Tragedy is coming on you. That catastrophic sense. The fear, powerless against catastrophe. You have no power. That's the fear. And then you make an alliance with fatalism, disease. Some people even make an alliance with suicide. I've been there. I know what that's like. I know a wonderful Christian couple from Minnesota, they have a great son, <laughs> an amazing athlete, very good looking, very smart, accomplished at school, liked by everybody, and I mean everybody, but a lie got into his thinking, a catastrophic mindset, and it was a worry about his future, and a sense of impending doom was allowed access to his life, and he didn't know how to deal with the stress. He felt anxiety overwhelming him, so to counterbalance those feelings, he made an alliance in his mind and in his thoughts with a sense of self-destruction, fatalism. That's just the way it's going to be. One day his parents came home to find him hanging. He committed suicide. A boy with everything to live for had believed a lie and allow the enemy to kill him from the inside out. Worry comes from an old English word meaning to strangle, to strangle like a wolf strangles its prey. My friend, the enemy wants to strangle you and me. Mark Twain said this. He said, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which have never happened. Isn't that the way of it? A lot of the things that we worry and we stress about and the things that we care about, a lot of those things never, ever come to pass. If faith moves mountains, then fear 
grows mountains. If faith moves mountains, then fear grows mountains. It grows problems and it grows the giant that we don't want, right? If I, if I were to give you an acronym for fear, now I know there's, I've heard people give these acronyms for fear. I've heard false evidence appearing real, but the problem is sometimes there's real evidence appearing real and that spells rear. So that's probably not the way to go. So I want to give you what I've made for you special, an acronym I just made up to help you better identify fear. It's falsehood because we know it's based on a lie, right? Falsehood eclipsing all reality. If there's an answer in front of me, if there's a shelter in front of me, but I allow fear, falsehood to come in and eclipse my eye, if I can let it get close enough to me, if I can magnify it big enough on my eye, I can have my finger block out everything in my sight. And that's the way of giants. They get magnified because they're based on a falsehood. They end up eclipsing all God's reality, all answers for your life. Fear left unchecked in your life has the power to destroy you from the inside out. Fear can and it will contaminate every part of your life. It spreads. It's contagious. It's a disease. A common fear is a failure and yet failure is not, fa is not fatal. Failure should be a part of us growing and our journey to success. Some of the greatest businessmen, some of the greatest athletes, they have stories of their major failures being a turning point in their life to become major successes. But the giant of fear says, quit, just give up, surrender and make an agreement with me. That's how Hitler's Nazi regime bullied and attacked Europe. But Britain would not surrender. Winston Churchill said this during World War II. He said, fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing. For how much? For maybe 1%? No, nothing. And yet we have the Lord telling us to beware or be cautious of lies and counterfeits. The Pharisees use lies and misrepresentation of God's character to control the people. Let's never forget for a second who the father of falsehood is. Let's take a look at John 8, verse 44. Jesus is talking and he says this, the devil was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's his resources, lies, deception. Satan is a thief, a murderer, and a destroyer. That's John 10, 10. But he accomplishes this, this, this heinous act by using his resources, his lies. The falsehood he spreads starts manifesting first in the form of fear, stress, worry, doubt, anxiety, and then he tortures the soul. Just like the Garden of Eden, look where fear came in and contaminated the most beautiful of all beauty, the most perfect of all perfection. In one single generation, we go from Adam and Eve, our grandparents, to Cain and Abel, and suddenly one lie turns into fear, rejection, jealousy, and then suddenly one brother murdering the other brother. The enemy loves to lob what I call fear grenades. The enemy can't stop you, right? Philippians 4.13 says that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Satan can't stop you, but he can persuade you to doubt and invert your faith. His plan is simple. His plan is basically because he can't stop you. His plan is to have you stop you. So he lobs these fear grenades. They spew lies. They explode with toxic fears and they unsettle your mind. Remember, God in 2 Timothy 1.7 has given you and me a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. The enemy doesn't want us operating in a sound mind. You're having a great week. You're feeling confident. You're hopeful. Suddenly the phone call, a phone call comes in, a text message, a, a worried thought, maybe even just an angry look from somebody, a neighbor, and doubt explodes in your heart. Remember what happens, right? Falsehood eclipsing. I got the wrong eye. Falsehood <laughs> eclipsing all reality. And boom, there is that fear grenade. Falsehood eclipsing all reality. You get a text message. Dad, this is happening. Falsehood eclipsing all reality. You get a little note from, a little sticky note from the boss. Falsehood eclipsing all reality. The doctor says, hey, I need to see you next week. Falsehood eclipsing all reality. 
when we get our eyes off of God's hand and onto the enemy's hand, man, he can torment us. Maybe, maybe it's only me who gets these fear bombs dropped on them. Nope, it's common. Well, how come I feel like I'm the only one? See, that's the devil's strategy. Isolation, divide and conquer. Jesus even said about the enemy, he knows this strategy, divide and conquer. His house is not divided. He's got a strategy against God's people, but he tries to inflict that on you, divide and conquer. Do you know how many people, men, who lay in bed trying to get a good night's sleep, worried, fretting, agonizing over what to do, which way to go, what's happening with my son, what's happening with my daughter, oh, my grandchildren, what about my future, what about my retirement, what about my job, I just lost my job. Falsehood, right, eclipsing all reality. You're looking at the lie and it's right up in your eye and all you know is the torment of fear. It is said that the most abused people would rather live in a known hell than an unknown heaven. The enemy's tricked us. He's tricked us into fearing the unknown. Nothing can terrorize a person. You imagine that? Unknown, nothing. Like, not even the truth, just a false reality can torment people. It's because these fear grenades blow up from the inside out, just like that beautiful young man in Minnesota blowing up from the inside out and actually destroying his thoughts and his life. So where's your covering? You got to have a defense. Philippians 4, 7 says this, and God's peace, oh, just say that, God's peace, which transcends all understanding, shall mount a guard over your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You and me, we got to stay in Christ Jesus. God saw our covering ripped away in the Garden of Eden, and He saw our vulnerability. And it may seem normal to us because we've been born into this world of corruption, but it's not acceptable to God. It's not acceptable to love. And fear is always unacceptable to love. You see, we are not entitled to our own definition of love in the presence of truth. And that's a good thing. Love never considers fear normal, acceptable, even tolerable. Love, we learn from 1 John 4, expels fear, throws fear out. My friends, love never ever shows fear, any kind of concession or understanding. When I was a boy, I remember eight and nine, I remember going out in the summertime where my grandmother lived on the East Coast. I remember going out in the lobster fishing boats on the Atlantic Ocean. And I want to tell you something, man, if you've never seen waves, like you've been, if you're in one of those fishing boats and you're in the trough between the waves on a big storm in the Atlantic Ocean, it's crazy. It's wild. And I remember just the awesome, the fearful, awesome sense of being in those gigantic Atlantic um, waves and being in this fishing boat. And the wave, sometimes the boat would come down off a huge wave that would be 12, 15 feet. And as it would hit the bottom of the trough, the next wave would come right up over the bow. And it was a fearsome thing. It was a, an amazing, overwhelming thing. Well, I want to take you to a little story about Jesus and his disciples when they're crossing the Lake of Galilee. We pick up the story here in Matthew 8, 24 through to 26. And suddenly, behold, there arose a violent storm on the sea so that the boat was being covered up by the waves, just like I said, going down, and man, it's so big, the waves are coming right over the bow of the boat. But check it out. Look at this next little line. But Jesus was asleep. Oh, I love it. And the next verse, verse 25, and his disciples came to him, and they had to wake him. They had to probably shake him a little bit and say, Lord, look at what they say. Lord, save us. That's a good line. But then the next line, we're dying. We perish. Not a good thing to say. Look at what they've got. Even though the waves are around them, they've got the creator of the waves in their boat. So then they've got that fear eclipsing their eye and all they can see is that, that fraudulent eclipse, eclipsing all reality. The reality was the king of all kings, the creator of the universe is in the boat with us. This should be fun. I remember even as a boy when I really didn't understand the danger we were in out on the Atlantic Ocean at 9 and 10 years old and the waves are coming over the boat. You're thinking, this is fun until the, until the guys you're with saying, this is dangerous. We could go down. Now it's scary because now all of a sudden you've got fear coming in. Verse 26, and Jesus said to them, 
Why are you afraid? Isn't that funny? To us, it's like it's obvious. Well, isn't it obvious? But see, to the Creator, to love, to God Almighty, He's like, I'm with you. Why are you afraid? Then He says this, here's the problem, O oh, you of little faith. You got a lot of fear, but you got very little faith. Then He arose, and God does what God always does. He rebukes the wind and the sea. Some translation says that He censured the wind and the sea like little puppies. Stop this. And then he said, and there was a great and wonderful calm. Jesus is asleep. He's at rest in the eye of the storm. See, he cares for you, but he don't care about fear. Fear doesn't move God. You do. Your faith moves him. Concern for you moves him. But fear never moves God. Love puts no value on the storm. Love puts all the value on you in the storm. And yet love marvels that you and I do. Remember what Jesus said? He said, why are you afraid? Disciples, don't you care that we're dying? Man, love don't care. Love cares for you. Love don't care about fear. Love doesn't give respect to fear. It demolishes fear, right? Isn't that what we learned in 1 John 4? Love grabs a hold of fear, throws it out the door. Why are you afraid, Jesus asks. Love will never normalize fear. Fear. It won't allow it. Love will never accept, normalize, bend, or make room for fear. You were designed to live fear free, and whom the sun sets free, with whom love sets free, is free indeed. John 8, 2 Timothy 1 7 says this For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Fear is a spiritual problem that takes advantage of situational occurrences like storms, bad news, bills, doctor reports, armies, and yes, those fear giants. But the answer always remains the same. It's a spiritual answer to a spiritual problem. That's what it's got to be because fear is a spiritual problem. That's, isn't that what we read? 2 Timothy 1, the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear for God has not given us a spirit of fear. The answer always remains the same. It's a spiritual answer to a spiritual problem. The gift of power, love, and a sound mind. It's threefold. God's power, His love, and the mind of Christ. The thoughts that come from God above through His Word. Fear is evil. The lies of your storm, the lies that your giant would yell, they're evil. Quit making deals with fear sanctifying your fears and making them out like somehow they're a hidden blessing from God. It's not going to work. That leaf that you're trying to pull over your shame and your nakedness, it's not going to work. It's not going to take the anxiety away. You have to deal with the root of the, the problem and trying to lie to yourself that somehow these fears are a blessing from God. That may give you a temporary relief, but it entrenches the deception. You cannot make peace with fear and anxiety. They're not meant to keep you humble, my friend. That's garbage thinking. The enemy laughs at you adopting that dysfunctional thinking. You don't learn from your fears. You learn from God, their Father. You learn from wisdom. Don't take counsel from your fears. Don't make decisions based on your fears. Say no to fear. You can be fearless and faith-filled. No fear here. Remember, the God of peace, which transcends all understanding, shall mount a guard over your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we exercise the gift of your power, your love, and your sound mind that you have given us. Lord, we repent of any agreement that we might have made with the spirit of fear. Forgive us. Forgive me, Lord. We lay down and renounce all worry, all anxiety, all fear right here at the cross, the place of your great victory, Jesus. And in its place, in place of the fear, we receive your love. We receive your power. We just don't leave an empty place in our heart where fear was, but we receive you, Lord. We receive your power, your love, and we declare that we have the mind of Christ. That means we've set our thoughts on the things above, on your word, on your promises, on your victory. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
you know what? I want to hear your story of how God has set you free from stress and worry. Please go to our website or our Facebook page and message us your story. What God has done for you will encourage others. So please don't be afraid, right? To tell the good news, God loves you. You can go to All Nations website at allnations.ca or to All Nations Facebook page. We want to hear from you. God bless you. Now let's celebrate what Jesus has done for us at the cross with his body and his shed blood. 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23, says this, I received from the Lord himself that which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. Here we have the, the, the bread, the body of Christ that was broken for us. And it says, and when he had given thanks, Jesus, he broke it. And he said, take this, my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. Hold the bread and just say, Father, I thank you for the body of Jesus. This body was broken for me that my life might be completely, totally put back together, made every bit whole. Jesus had stripes on his back for my healing. I receive it. Now let's honor Jesus and take the bread. Verse 25, in the same manner after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. He said, do this as often as you drink it, affectionately calling me to remembrance. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus, we thank you for your shed blood. This is proof that we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Jesus, your blood, your DNA speaks continually of mercy, forgiveness, love. And we believe we receive we appropriate the benefits of your precious shed blood in your name. Now let's stand and let's worship the Lord in a song of praise.